Welcome to our continuing series on the beliefs of Jesus. Uh, this is really the third in the series. And the basic theme that we've been following is very simple. Many people believe things about Jesus. Some people believe in Jesus. But very few people seem to believe like Jesus. So we're looking into this idea of what did Jesus of Nazareth believe? And though I'm coming from within the Christian tradition, and in fact filming this for our church in Summerlin, California, I've designed the teaching uh, to reach anybody who might have an interest both in the spiritual life and in the teachings of Jesus about the spiritual life. So whether you come from my tradition or another tradition or no tradition, I think you'll benefit by knowing what this one of the greatest persons who's ever walked the face of the earth thought about reality. Jesus of Nazareth, what did he believe? Now what we've covered so far last week was Jesus' primary, what I call, control belief. It, it controlled the other beliefs that he held. It, it's the lens through which he saw reality, and he had a phrase for it. He called it the kingdom of God. And today, that phrase probably doesn't ring quite as much because, at least in America, we don't have kings. And um, uh, in fact, we, we, as I mentioned last week, we, we got rid of a king to start our experiment. So the kingdom of God is probably not the metaphor he would use today, in my opinion, if Jesus were here in the flesh today. But what he did mean by it, we looked at last week, which was the nearness of the divine, the nearness of God, the nearness of the spirit, that, that you don't have to go far away. The, the spirit of love, the spirit of God is all around you, even in you. You're swimming in it and may not even recognize it. And the, all of the rest of the teachings of Jesus fit under this rubric of the kingdom of God. In fact, his parables, one of which we're going to look at today, almost always start by the kingdom of heaven, which is synonymous with the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like a farmer who went into his field, is like a woman who had lost a coin, is like a man who'd lost one of his sheep out of his herd of a hundred sheep. So the kingdom was the matrix for all of the teachings of Jesus. And the key was that he believed in the nearness of God, the deep sway of love, the deep sway of love, that there's this loving presence and power pulling on every single human being that emanates out from God, coming toward all people everywhere all of the time. And it's closer to you and closer to me than our own breath. That's the kingdom of God. So the question I want to explore today is, what did Jesus think was at the center of that kingdom? You know, when I was growing up as a boy, uh, when I was in about the fourth grade, we lived outside of Buffalo, New York. And uh, we lived out in the countryside. And I used to get to roam the countryside with, with my dog, Topper. And uh, I, I couldn't have been happier. And it, if any of you know Buffalo, New York, in the winter, it is very cold, very windy, and snow drifts would go up as high as the roof of our house. And I would just love it because I'd dress warm. I was young and topper, and I would go run in the, in the fields outside our house, and we had a ravine with a little tiny creek running through it when, uh, when it was summer, and we would dig and build snow caves. And, then I'd start to get a little bit cold and it, the sun would be going down because it was after school and I would make my way back to my house and I can still remember the lights on in my house and just knowing that as soon as I opened that door with all covered with snow, when I opened that door, it would be warm inside. And uh, more times than not, my mother would have some hot cocoa ready for me and I'd take off my my boots and shake the snow out of them and take off my uh, snow coat and my mittens and all those things and hat and and I'd sit down to the warmth of not just the cocoa not just the warmth of the inside of the house but to the warmth of my mother being there to hear about my day that that 
was such a, a positive memory for me, is such a positive memory for me. It, it was that kind of warmth and belonging that Jesus was talking about when he talked about the kingdom and what was at the center of the kingdom. It was something like that. A warm-hearted mother with a hot cocoa and you get to take off your freezing cold, ice-covered clothes and enjoy the home where you belong. Now he told a story, Jesus himself, about this which uh, describes what is at the center. Now let's just take the very word kingdom of God. What would you expect to find at the center of the kingdom of God? You'd expect to find a king. But actually there's a surprise. That, that's not what we find. We find something else, at least in most of the parables of Jesus. You know, kings in the day of Jesus were not known to be benevolent. The king who was the king over Israel when Jesus was alive had, had slaughtered uh, whole groups of children to try to get to the baby Jesus. He had, he had crucified thousands of adult men uh, for very um, odd reasons and trumped up reasons. Uh, all along the road that led right up to where Jesus lived. So the, the king, King Herod was his name, uh, it didn't engender a lot of warmth in people. Now there were certainly uh, statements in the Old Testament or the Torah, as our Jewish friends referred to it, uh, of good kings. But there were a lot of bad kings interspersed in there too. So finding a king at the center of the kingdom might not be the warmest uh, one, it would be an image of power though. And that's not exactly the image Jesus wanted to lead with. So here's a story he told. You know, in the uh, Eastern traditions, in, in Asian traditions, for example, in Buddhism and Hinduism, uh, they have these uh, metaphors called koans. And they're, they're almost like riddles. And they're meant to have the person who's reflecting on them get jarred out of their normal way of thinking. And Jesus' parables or stories were a lot like that. He, he was trying to jar people out of their kind of linear way of thinking about God and, and the spiritual life. So here's his story. I'm not going to read it to you. I'm going to tell it to you. And I'm going to tell it to you the way I think the original people listening to it might have responded. So l let me encourage you. If you got something else going on, set it down, put it away, and, and enter into this like, like a child listening to a story that you've never heard, even if you've heard it before. Well, it started out, Jesus said, there was a father who had two sons. <laughs> and the crowd, you know, they were used to storytelling. This is an oral culture. This was, most people were illiterate at that time in that culture. And so, they, would, they, would, they had a strong oral tradition. Oh, this is, a, this is a story about a father and two sons. I'll bet one of them's good and one of them's bad. And I'll bet the bad one's going to get what he deserves. That, and I could even see a father with his son in the crowd listening to Jesus and kind of nudging his son to listen closely. Yeah, there'll be one good one and there'll be one bad one. And sure enough, Jesus starts the story out and he says, there are these two sons and one son comes to the father and he says, Father, I want my inheritance now. That would have been completely offensive in that culture. And the crowd would have been going, boo, that's the bad son. We know which one it is. It's that guy who wants his inheritance before his father dies. And then a surprise comes along. The father says, okay. And he divides the inheritance and he gives the half to this bad son. And everybody's thinking, that son's, it's not going to turn out good for him. I know that much. And the other son didn't ask for that. And so they're going, that's the good son. So the one takes the money, boo. <laughs> and the other one works in the fields for his father. The one who takes the money finally leaves home. Really, boo, bad news, leaving home in a kinship culture. And this father, a mythical father, listening with his son would be kind of nodding, you know, like, don't you ever go off like that. Don't you ask for that inheritance. And he not only goes off to a far country where the goyim live, the outsiders, the non-Jewish people, he goes off there and squanders the entire inheritance. And everybody in the crowd is going, I told you, 
that's, I knew that guy would do that. Uh, and, and the other son, the good one, he doesn't squander his money. He's a saver. He, you know, he's saving it up. He's putting it away for a good future plan. Everybody's going, yeah, that's the kind of son we want. He squanders it, and not just in kind of overspending, he uses it on wild living and prostitutes, and, and the people are going, oh, man, this guy's really gone we would say down the tubes. I mean, he's really self-destructive. And sure enough, it gets worse. When his money runs out, he winds up in the worst possible place for a Jewish boy to wind up, in a pigsty. And he not only winds up in the pigsty, while his other brother is living in his father's home, enjoying food, he's the bad son is starving to death in the pigsty. And and actually wishes he could eat what the pigs eat. And you can't imagine the Jewish audience going, oh, are you kidding? Eating what pigs eat, living with pigs? This is the, so non-kosher. I mean, this is off the charts. Now, they're really, this, this guy, when he is a fool, and he's going to get what he deserves. He's already getting it. It's obvious. So the one son's at home with his father, enjoying the banquet table. The other one's in a pigsty. And we know that this bad son has reaped what he's sown. And that will be the end of the story. But it's not. The story goes on. Not so fast. Because then Jesus says, the bad son in the pigsty, starving to death, wanting to eat what the pigs ate, came to his senses. And the crowd would have been going, what? He came to his senses? This, the story's not supposed to go that way. He came to his senses, and he said this to himself. He said, now look, even my father's servants are doing better than I'm doing. I clearly don't deserve to be his son anymore. I've wrecked that. But I'm going to go back to my father. I'm going to return home, and I'm going to say to him, Father, I've sinned against you, and I've sinned against God. I don't deserve to be called your son any longer. It's obvious. I, I accept full responsibility. Would you just take me on as a servant. And so he starts home. Well, this is confusing to the people in the crowd because there are good people and bad people according to them. God likes the good people and doesn't like the bad people. And so uh, this is getting confusing. Well, it, it gets even worse. Now, the, the bad son is coming back, which is confusing, and the good son is still out in the fields working hard, putting together an irrigation system for the next year's crop, I'm guessing. And uh, the, the father, as a good patriarch in those days would do, is I'm picturing him sitting on the front porch of his house. And he looks down the road, and Jesus says he saw his son from a far way off. So he sees this no good son coming up the road. Now the crowd is going, oh, we get it. That kid is going to get a thrashing. He's going to come up. The father's going to sit there on the porch and wait for that kid to come up and beg for mercy. Or better yet, maybe some of the community will meet him first and they'll administer justice, mob justice on this kid, which actually was part of the culture at the time. So the father will sit there. This is what they're imagining. The kid will come up. Either he'll be attacked by a mob who, who know what a horrible thing he's done, or maybe he'll make it to his father and beg on his knees, and then maybe we'll see what the father would do, maybe have him lashed or beaten. But then a big surprise comes in the story Jesus is telling. It says the father saw his son a far way off, and he ran down the road toward his son. And he throws his arms around him. And he kisses him. And then he yells, bring the best robe. Bring the ring. Bring my best robe. Bring the ring, which was probably his ring, most likely a signet ring that he would use for signing things. But get new sandals for my son. And in fact, that, that calf which we've been nurturing and feeding for a big feast, he's all fattened and it's, it's going to be a great barbecue. Kill that fatted calf and we're going to celebrate because this son of mine was dead. And now he's alive. Whew. 
well, the people in the crowd are really confused now. Now it looks like from their perspective, we have a bad father because he's, uh, we might say he's being codependent on his, with his son. He's not punishing him for his, his uh, bad mistakes, for his self-destructive lifestyle. And, and, and he doesn't seem to get what he deserves. In fact, instead, he gets mercy, well, not just mercy. He gets no shame. He gets no guilt. And instead, he gets love, acceptance, forgiveness, and restoration to his father, to his family, and to the community. That's not supposed to happen. And the people right about at this point are thinking, well, if this happens to the bad brother, bad son, what happens to the good one? Well, the story goes on. It's like the camera moves out to the fields where the good son is working and, and the good son is hearing the sound of the celebration going on back home. And so he asks one of the other servants of his father, what's going on back there? And the servant says, uh, your brother's come home and, and your dad's killed the fatted calf, which the older brother would have been thinking, the good brother, who is the older brother, would have been thinking, well, wait, that calf was supposed to be for a party for me, for all the good things I've been doing. So he hears the music, and he refuses to go in to the house of his father. And when you think about that, it's sort of odd that the one son left the house of his father, squandered all his money, etc., and the other son won't come in to the house of his father. So the father does the same thing for the older son, the good son, that he did for the bad son. He leaves the house and comes out to him, to where he is. And he listens to, to his refrains, to his grievances. In fact, uh, the good son says, this son of yours, he won't call him his brother. He's so estranged from him in his heart at this point. This son of yours squanders your money on prostitutes and bad living, winds up in a pigsty with the goyim, and he comes back and you kill the fatted calf for him. And you haven't given me as much as a little sheep to celebrate with my friends. And the father says to him very tenderly, Son, you've been with me always. I've been with you always. And everything I have is yours. But... This brother of yours, he corrects him, not just the son of mine, this brother of yours was dead. And now he's alive. He, he was lost. And now he's found. So we had to celebrate and be glad. And then Jesus ends the parable there. He, he doesn't tell us if the older brother ever came in. And so he leaves it dangling with the people in the crowd who, of course, were relating to the older brother, not the younger brother, thinking that they're good servants of God, that they go to uh, their religious services every week or this, and they do these rituals, and they don't cheat, and they don't do these things. And then they realize they might be more like that older brother than that younger brother. And they're left wondering, will they come in? Will they come in? There's a book written by an author named Henri Nouwen. And in that book, it's called The Return of the Prodigal. Many people call this the story of the prodigal son. Prodigal means prodigious all the way out to the fullest extent. His sin, his brokenness, his uh, self-destructive habits were prodigal. They, they, he took it to the farthest limit. But actually, in Jesus' mind, this is not a story about the prodigal nature of the son's misdeeds. It's about the prodigal nature of the father's love. That it would come out, that it would throw arms around, that it would kiss, that it would get new sandals, that it would give a new ring, that it would kill the fatted calf. And in the return of the prodigal in Henri Nouwen's book, he, he says, who are you in the story? Are you like the older son? Are you like the younger son that went away? Or are you like the older son who was out in the field? 
And he suggests that at times we're all three of the characters. Sometimes we're the wayward son, and we need to come to our senses because we know there's a loving father waiting to run down the hill. Sometimes we're the older brother feeling pretty aggrieved that all our hard work has not been affirmed by the one we, we wanted so much love from. And sometimes we're actually that loving presence of the father or the mother figure, if you wish, who would welcome you in with a hot cup of cocoa, who would say, here, take off your snow clothes here and come sit by the fire. Sometimes we're the person meant to extend that love to other. This was what was at the center of Jesus' paradigm, the, the kingdom of God. It wasn't a king. It was a father. And Jesus uses a particular word to describe this father. And actually, our translations are too afraid to put it the way he put it. Ours say, Father, like in the Lord's Prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer, a prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples. We say, Our Father who art in heaven. Jesus would have actually said, Our Abba, or in modern English, Our Daddy who art in heaven or who, who is in heaven. He used a very familiar term for God, way too familiar for his culture. In fact, the words that were used in Hebrew for God at that time were so holy that the actual name of God was never pronounced. And you would use other names like the Lord instead of saying the name of God himself, I am, Yahweh. And Jesus takes that and turns it on its head and says, this God, who's way more powerful than a king, but he's completely benevolent, is like a daddy. Now, you have to remember, in Jesus' day, daddies were very powerful. Uh, they had their right over all kinds of things. It was a patriarchal society. But he describes this dad as a daddy, as a warm, embracing, powerful, yes, but loving, merciful, compassionate, tender, restorative presence, never shaming, never giving you what you deserve. This was a daddy who's about cleansing you, clothing you, and celebrating your return to the family. That is what is at the center of the kingdom that Jesus thought about. Now imagine yourself. What if you lived every day the way Jesus did with this as your reality? that you can come in out of the snow or out of the pigsty or out of the field where you've been working hard and you can come into the home of a daddy who has nothing but love. You know, if you had that as your reality, which is what Jesus woke up thinking about every day, that was the reality he lived in. In contradistinction to what was happening in the Roman Empire at the time, the corruption, the, the slaughters, the war, the... Uh, all the misdeeds, this was his reality. There is an Abba, and there is a family, and there is a home for me where I belong. And so therefore, there's no room for fear. There's no room for insecurity. There's no room for shame, for guilt, for brooding, for grudges. It's an entirely different way to live one's life. So I would ask you today, what do you feel? What's at the center of your thinking? What's at the center of your view of reality? Is it this Abba, this warm-hearted, tender father? Or frankly, if he was teaching here today in 21st century world, I think he might say Abba or Ama, which would be the, the feminine version of that. In fact, in the parable right before Jesus tells this one, the figure for God is a woman who's lost her coin, which is like a wedding ring. And she's searching for it all through the house. So, so Jesus had parables that demonstrated the feminine of God as well as the, the masculine. But Abba was his primary term for God. In fact, in his opening address called the Sermon on the Mount, which is only about 18 minutes long, if you read it out loud, and it's only about three and a half pages in the Bible. So picture three and a half pages Jesus uses the word Abba 16 times. That tells you what's at the center of his heart, what's at the center of his mind. Abba. Every moment 
of Jesus' life, he felt and knew an onslaught of tenderness from this God. He understood and experienced a siege of compassion from this God. And that was the center of his paradigm. Abba, Abba, my dad, my daddy.
Welcome, uh, and welcome especially to our Summerlin family. Uh, I want to mention that this Sunday, today, is uh, one year ago when we had to decide to quit meeting in person because of the pandemic. And at that moment, I remember making the decision with our session, our elders, uh, and it was a very difficult decision. And we thought it might last six weeks, and it was a difficult decision. If we had known it was going to last an entire year and more, I don't think we could have believed it. And it's been a hard year. Um, some of you have lost friends and loved ones to COVID. I've lost some family members myself and family members of dear friends. Uh, it's been a hard year, and, and another piece that's made it hard or even harder is that we as a faith community have not been able to be with one another uh, through the website and through zoom and things like that we've been able to carry on uh, our work of teaching about the beliefs of jesus in this case recently and the entire scriptures and so that's that's been a good thing and it's uh, took a little scrambling to figure out how to do that well there's light at the end of the tunnel. We're all very grateful for that. I certainly am. Many of you have had one or two vaccines already. I encourage you, if you haven't, please get them. Uh, we need to, as people of faith, be serving our larger community by staying safe. But we're going to meet outdoors on Easter Sunday, and I am so excited about it. Uh, you'll have to check our website for the location, it's still to be determined, but it will be in Summerland itself. And we're looking forward to seeing you in person, socially distanced, with all the protocols in place that keep us safe. But we'll be together. And uh, we're trying to work on uh, avenues to be together uh, in the interim after that, before we're able to get back into our own building, which as you know, is quite small. So check the website uh, for the further information on Easter and just know that uh, we're really, really excited to be with you. And the last thing I want to say is thank you. Thanks for keeping us alive uh, as a church uh, during this year financially with your prayers, with your encouraging notes and the way you've reached out to one another in the midst of these hard times. Uh, you know, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against the kingdom and uh, they didn't. And uh, we're, gonna, we're not only going to make it through this together, I think we're going to be a lot deeper and I hope uh, more loving because of it.